Coming up on Network Africa today. Liberia resident to go to the polls to elect a new president for the next six years. France to start withdrawal of troops from Niger as Algeria puts pause on mediation efforts. Kenya court puts Haiti deployment on temporary hold. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Anne Mwawado in Lagos. We start in Liberia where polls have opened in downtown Muserato, which hosts Liberia's capital city of Monrovia as the country re elects a president for the next six-year tenure. Well, voters have reportedly turned up in their numbers, some of them queuing since the wee hours of the morning to enable them vote early. Our correspondent, Maokwe Ogun Yusuf, who's with Yaga Africa Study and Observer Mission, sending this report. It's a beautiful morning here in Monserrato, downtown Monrovia in Liberia, uh, where the people of Liberia are coming out for the fourth consecutive time since the end of a conflict in 2003 to exercise their franchise and elect once again another president or a president who will take them through the next six years. 20 candidates are contesting in this election and the incumbent president, George Ware, is seeking a second term. Right now, we're standing in precinct 30368. Uh, a precinct is like a polling station in Nigeria uh, and it consists of several polling units. This particular precinct has about four polling places. That's what they're called right here in Liberia. And unlike previous days since we've been here, where it has rained every single morning, the weather is clear, the skies are blue, and the people are out in their numbers, showing their enthusiasm uh, for the continuation of a democracy, which they hope will work for them. Well, residents in Liberia are now reporting a large turnout and mostly peaceful voting process in polling stations across Muserato. Our correspondent, Marbwe Ogun Yusuf, who's currently in Liberia, caught up with a third leading candidate, Alexandra Cummins, after he had voted. Let's be true. I understand that you voted today. May I see the top three? I just voted. Uh -huh. And I voted for number four, Alexandra Cummings. How was the process for you? Actually, the process went well. Um, the turnout appears to be high. The turnout to the lives were long. The process appears to be working. It's a bit slow, but it's working. And I'm not going to ensure people are calm, patient, and people are great to that with the problem. Okay, so are you satisfied with what you're seeing so far in terms of how the National Electoral Commission has been conducting uh, the election, deployment, etc.? Well, I've only been to one polling station, so on that basis, I can assess exactly what's happening around the country. But the one polling station where I register, the process of years to be working. Okay. What exactly is the priority for you to discuss for the Liberian people whom I have spoken with so far? Please very, very high on the agenda. How big a priority is that? So our priority today, yesterday, tomorrow is for peaceful, non-violent elections. I encourage Liberians, my supporters, to be patient, to follow the process. This is not worth anybody's life. Uh, and so peace is a priority. The next priority for us is to encourage our people to get off the board, encourage Liberians to vote. And third is to monitor the way. So we have more watchers, observers, monitoring people. So those are the priorities, peace, violence, patience, getting off the boat, and then monitoring people. In most places you've been to in Montserrat, it's pretty good for it. I mean, the turnout, as you know, that it's very high. Have you been able to get the same feedback in the other counties where the election is out to um, The feedback I've done is been mixed. Mostly uh, high turnout, mostly going well. But some locations were not open, the jewels were not there in some of the remote locations. So the feedback has been mixed, but mostly the fact that it worked so far. All right, peace is uppermost on the minds of Liberians as they go to the polls. But earlier on, Channel's television had a moment on the way to George Weah's polling unit, where a local journalist was pressing former President Goodluck Jonathan to comment on what he tends to do to ensure peace reigns in their polls. 
given his experience. We are working with the West Ham, uh, we are working with AU, we are covering the reasonable ground. And I believe at the end of the day, the elections will be successful. Which Liberia was, towards the close of the day, we can make a formal statement. And here now is Malkwe Ogu Yusuf, who is on ground in Liberia observing the conduct of the election. Hello, Malkwe. Uh, give us a sense of how the voting exercise is going on today in Liberia. It's the second Tuesday in the month of October, according to the constitution of the people of Liberia. Uh, the people are out in their numbers and they are so enthusiastic about the general elections. Um, they are out to vote for position of the president and also that of the a vice president, as well as lawmakers. They operate a bicameral legislature. They have the Senate and the House of Reps members. And that is happening in all polling units across Liberia today. Uh, the enthusiasm is something that is palpable. The people are out in their numbers. Neck deployed on time in many of the polling units that we have been to. The crowds are a bit overwhelming. Some of them coming out very early in the morning. I mean, the, the polls are supposed to open at 8 a.m., but they were there way before 6 a.m., some of them. Uh, as you can see right behind me, they are still there in their numbers, waiting patiently for them to be able to exercise their franchise. And how are party agents conducting themselves at the polls as they also monitor the elections there? So far, so good. In all of the polling units that we have been to, it does appear that members of the National Electoral Commission, and this is very important because this is the first time that the National Electoral Commission is conducting an election by itself, unassisted, unlike in the past when it had gotten support uh, from other agencies and from other well-meaning international bodies. This is the first time that it is conducting the elections by itself. And it does appear that they have done quite a bit of uh, training for their members of staff. Um, and even the political parties and their agents are well aware of where they ought to be. So in many of the, many of the polling units that we have been to, uh, not only have uh, members of, st of staff, that's the NEC, be very aware of what their role uh, should be, We've also seen the party agents sitting very peacefully and watching the vote in a very transparent manner. All right. Thank you very much, Malkwe Ogun Yusuf. I shall get updates later. Let's continue with other stories now. We take you to Niger, where the military junta is expecting the withdrawal of French troops from its territory to start today. The junta will be escorting the first convoy of French soldiers out of the country. While it's still not clear, however, how they will be leaving Land borders with neighboring Benin and Nigeria to the south are still closed. But others with Mali, Burkina Faso and Chad, which are also under military rule, remain open. About 1,500 French soldiers have been helping Nigerian forces fight militants affiliated with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group. There have been tensions between the both countries since a coup in July overthrew the democratically elected president and French ally Mohamed Bazoum. Meanwhile, Algeria has announced a suspension of efforts to mediate the, mediate the political crisis in Niger following the coup in July. In a statement, its foreign affairs ministry pointed out that declarations from the Nigerian authorities had raised legitimate questions about their very real willingness to follow through on their acceptance of Algerian mediation. It has now put the process on hold pending a commitment from the junta to continue with mediation talks. But just last month, Niger accepted Algeria's offer to mediate in the political crisis aimed at returning the country to constitutional rule. In August this year, Algeria had proposed a six-month transition period led by a civilian authority. But the head of the junta, General Abdurrahman Chiani, who seized power in July, wanted a three-year transition period. 
And still in news about Niger, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has spoken to the ousted president, Mohamed Bazoum, reiterating his support for a democratically elected government. He reaffirmed that a democratically elected civilian-led government presents the best opportunity to ensure that Niger remains a strong partner in security and development of the region. The U.S. called for immediate release of all those unjustly detained following the military takeover. The junta, led by General Abdurrahman Chiani, has set up a transitional government, but its plan for a three-year transition period was rejected by the regional bloc echoers. Let's head to Kenya now, where a court has temporarily suspended a government plan to send police to Haiti on a UN-backed mission aiming to restore calm to the gang-infested Caribbean nation. The case was filed as opposition political Ikuru Akot, who argued the deployment was unconstitutional as it was not backed by any law or treaty. Akot, who's a lawyer who helped draft Kenya's revised 2010 constitution, charged that Kenya was deploying its police abroad at a time it had failed to quell insecurity within its own borders. But just last week, the United Nations Security Council had approved a Kenyan-led multinational security force for the troubled country, with Nairobi promising 1,000 police officers. Haiti, the Western Hemisphere poorest country, has been in turmoil for years now, with armed gangs taking over parts of the country, unleashing brutal violence, and the economy and public health systems also in tatters. Details of Kenya's deployment are still not finalized, with Parliament yet to approve the move as required by law. A rights group, Human Rights Watch, has accused Rwanda of using repressive tactics to target its critics abroad, including those who have sought international protection. The report has been published as the UK Supreme Court hears the British government's appeal against a ruling blocking its plans to deport asylum seekers to Rwanda. It has asked the UK not to consider Rwanda a safe country. HRW's UK director, Yasmin Ahmed, says the findings highlight that Rwanda is not a country the UK should rely upon to hold international standards or the rule of law when it comes to asylum seekers. Rwanda denies these allegations, with government spokesperson Yolande Makolo accusing HRW of distorting the reality and advancing a politicized agenda. Well, that report purports to have interviewed about 150 people across the globe covering the period since President Paul Kagame won elections in 2017. And still ahead on Network Africa... Africa's drone industry experiences transformation and growth covering several sectors. Bring you the details. Please stay with us. Welcome back. The government in the Democratic Republic of Congo is lamenting the East African Regional Forces' inability to restore peace in the east of the country and demanding its exit by December. According to government spokesman Patrick Muyaya, the M23 rebels have refused to withdraw from the areas under their occupation in accordance with agreements signed in Luanda, Angola just last year. Since last November, troops from Uganda, Burundi, South Sudan and Kenya have all been deployed as part of the EAC force to restore peace in the troubled North Kivu province. The mineral-rich region has been marred with conflict for at least two decades now, with different armed groups operating there despite the presence of UN peacekeeping forces since 1999. And back home in Nigeria, the Lagos State Governor Babajide Sanwolu will, on October the 21st, open Badagri's Door of Return to mark this year's Diaspora Festival, tagged 4th Lagos Door of Return. That's according to the chairman of the Nigerians and Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabiri Rewa, who made this known at a press conference at Alausa, Ikeja. She says the door will be opened permanently, signifying that Africans and Nigerians and Diaspora are permanently welcomed back to the country. While the State Commissioner for Tourism, Art and Culture, Toka Benson Awuyinka, assures the NITCOM chairman of supporting this initiative, because Badagri has a lot to offer the people of Lagos and Nigeria. The door of return includes receiving our brothers and sisters that were taken away as slaves 
over 400 years ago, historically, spiritually, um, emotionally, and physically, is a connection to what we call the joy of return. They're going to take a long walk through that path to the point of no return. Then I'll come back when we receive them as kings and queens from a place where their ancestors were taken away many, many years ago. It's a very emotional ceremony and it's an event that everybody needs to participate in. If I have a human being, needs to walk through that door. Now what the Lagos State will do eventually is build a permanent door in Badagwe, Lagos. So when you come witness the joy of return ceremony, on the 21st of October, you're going to see what Badagri has, what Lagos has for tourism, what no country in the world has that Badagri has. And I believe that if the Lagos State government builds on this, this will be a world with no heritage for anywhere in the world. So this will include a visit to historical sites. They'll have their names uh, changed. They're going to walk through the door. And it's excellent to come back today, someone will be allowed to open the door to the joy of return. This is something that the Lagos State Government is committed to. We are going to restore what she has called the door of return and the joy of return. We're going to make sure that every black man who wishes to trace their history back to Africa comes through that door. And um, Mr. Babagide Sawolu is committed to this project. Badagri is a hidden treasure. Badagri is somewhere where everybody who, who is residing in Lagos and Nigeria must visit at one point in time in their life. Unmanned aerial vehicles, commonly known as drones, serve as a multitude of purposes, but they play crucial roles in tasks such as climate monitoring, disaster relief operations, photography, recreation, and even goods delivery. However, their most recognized and contentious application lies in military operations, including surveillance and targeted strikes. Here in Africa, the drone industry is experiencing growth, transforming into a substantial sector. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Simosa, reports. Technological innovation. A South African company is spearheading the development of the continent's largest unmanned aerial vehicle, commonly known as drones. But what does this innovation mean for South Africa and the entire continent at large? I had the opportunity to speak with Daniel Duplessis, communications manager at Milco. So this is the largest UAV that's ever been produced on the African continent. Um, it is officially the largest one by any standard, um, but it's categorized as a medium altitude, long endurance UAV. There are only a few companies worldwide that have the capability and have successfully completed programs for the development of such a large scale UAV. And essentially, it makes it possible for South Africa and also other African member states to make use of this technology for operations within the Defence Force and security branches. As some countries endeavour to bolster their drone production capabilities, there have been reported delays in the progress of these drones. Daniel shed some light on the obstacles faced in this regard. South Africa has a rich history of using UAVs since the 1980s, actually. And they've continued to develop with their own internal programs, uh, various different sizes and applications of UAVs in general. And you're quite right in saying in the last 20 years it has been kind of quiet. And the main reason for that is there was a big skills drain from South Africa. Highly experienced engineers and software developers leaving the country to work for other com companies abroad. And for us, as a, as, a, as a new developer of these technologies, it was quite important to secure those critical resources and skills um, in a, to enable us to successfully complete this program. So that has been a massive challenge. We had to recruit some of the top minds from South Africa and across the, the world in order to facilitate and, and drive the necessary programs uh, to complete this project. And luckily, we have been able to do so and we've been able to do so in quite a good track record and a quite a good margin. I think many other countries have attempted such projects in the past and have also come to the same conclusion and the same understanding uh, that the skills and your team that you have to work on this project uh, critically drives the success of it. 
What is the purpose behind the design of these drones? What role are they intended to fulfill? The, the, this UAV is categorized as a medium altitude, long endurance UAV. And essentially what it means, it's, it's a high endurance or long endurance reconnaissance, surveillance and intelligence gathering platform. Essentially what you can do with it is conduct field operations and surveillance operations to gather as much intel as possible either before conducting ground-based operations or during ground-based operations to provide vital real-time feedback back to your command base in order to make informed decisions. The drone with a wingspan of 18.6 meters can remain in the air for 35 uninterrupted hours, sometimes impossible with a manned craft because humans need to rest. The craft can fly up to 2,000 kilometers. As part of the agreement with the South African Department of Defense, the first aircraft produced will be used exclusively by the South African government. From Centurion, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channel Television News. Well, that's the beauty of technology. In other stories, in a display of national pride, the Nigerian community in South Africa came together to commemorate Independence Day 2023. That event saw the presence of high-ranking government officials, featuring a special segment highlighting Nigeria's accomplishments across different domains. It also underscored the nation's journey since gaining independence, showcasing challenges and the progress made in politics, economy and much more. A South Africa correspondent, Innocent Simusa, also reports. The celebration was a display of Nigerian culture featuring traditional music and dance. Nigerian ambassador to South Africa, Mr. Haruna Manta, emphasized the importance of unity and cooperation amongst Nigerians living in South Africa. I invite you to join hands with us in celebrating our nation's achievement and enduring friendship between Nigeria and South Africa. Our relationships are vital components of this friendship, and I'm confident that with continued cooperation and collaboration, we can achieve even greater successes ahead. On behalf of the South African government, Minister of Basic Education, Enji Motseha, highlighted the strong bilateral ties between Nigeria and South Africa. South Africa welcomes the economic cooperation between our two countries and the steps taken to increase trade volumes as well as private sector investment. Nigeria remains one of our greatest trading partners in West Africa and total trade between South Africa and, and Nigeria amounts to approximately 44.8 billion in 2022. We are committed to further enhance our bilateral relations to Nigeria, to the government of Nigeria and the people of Nigeria, the whole people of Nigeria, I want to convey our congratulations on the occasion of the National Day. For us, the Cubans, South Africa, uh, Africa as a whole, and Nigeria is a, a part of our life. Participants are telling me that the event is not only highlighting Nigeria's cultural heritage, but also fostering a sense of unity and pride amongst the Nigerian community in South Africa. Having born, been born after the independence, um, I foresee, I visualize what our forefathers fought, just like South Africans, to gain independence. In a short form, we are happy that we are liberated. I feel so excited to be here, and I'm so proud to be a Nigerian. As you can see, white and green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to be here. The Nigerian ambassador to South Africa, Mr. Haruna Manta, says he's glad that some of the issues that are facing Nigerians are being addressed at government level here in South Africa. But he also mentioned that it's moving at a slow pace. From Pretoria, South Africa, at the Nigerian Embassy, Innocent Samos, Channel Television News. And that's it on Network Africa for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Please stay safe.